Welcome to Breaking Doctrine, presented to you by the Combined Arms Doctrine Directorate at the Combined Arms Center at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. The views expressed here are those of the individual and do not represent the views of the Combined Arms Center, U.S. Army, or U.S. Government. Hello, I'm Major Chris Parker, and this podcast topic is the Security Force Assistance Brigade. With me today is Brigadier General Charles Mazarakia, Director of the Mission Command Center of Excellence, Brigadier General Don Hill, the Combined Arms Center Deputy Commanding General for Education, and Colonel Rich Creed, Director of the Combined Arms Doctrine Directorate, or CAD. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Today we're exploring a relatively new addition to the Army's force structure that both of my guests have had the privilege of commanding, and that's the Security Force Assistance Brigade, or SFAB. Now, because this is a new organization, I want to get to the origin story of the SFAB. But before we do that, I think we need to first start by doctrinally defining what security force assistance is. So, Colonel Creed, could you lead us off with kind of a brief explanation of security force assistance and some of the examples of typical SFA tasks? Yeah, sure, Chris. Thanks. Um, So what Army Doctrine says is security force assistance uh, is the DOD activities that support the development of the capacity and capability of foreign security forces and their supporting institutions. Uh, And and that's right out of joint doctrine. So the Army uh, pulls uh, and uses joint terms whenever we can so that everybody's on the same sheet of music. And we say that security force assistance um, is one of four security cooperation activities. So security cooperation is the broad category of things that the Army does in competition, crisis, or conflict. Um, And so those four broad activities that fall under security cooperation are security assistance, uh, internal defense and development, uh, and security sector reform. Um, And so within the decisive action framework, and we talk in terms of decisive action uh, as the Army's operating uh, concept, right? It's it's simultaneous or near simultaneous execution of offense, defense, stability, uh, or defense support to to, to civil authorities. Um, So what are the SFA activities? They're primarily conducted to assist host countries uh, defend against internal and transnational threats to their stability. But, you know, DOD also conducts SFA to assist host countries defend effectively against external threats. And we see that uh, in Europe uh, with conventional units. Uh, And we also contribute to coalition operations or organize, train, equip, and advise another country's security forces. And I think that's what we'll focus on uh, here today. We'll get to the SFA tasks that the SFABs did uh, as General Hill and and, and General Masaraki uh, share their experiences with us. There are some very specific examples. There's things that uh, folks other than SFABs do as well, you know, doctrine development, organization training programs, uh, and leader development as well. So just to frame this a bit, sir, um, what are some of the more prominent historical examples of security force assistance? Um, And then what doctrine do we fall back on for this mission today? Well, so the Army's done this for a really long time, um, probably going back you know, close to 100 years, maybe more than 100 years if you count the experience in the Philippines, right? But as far as, far as formal programs, we had Korean Military Advisor Group, KMAG, uh, which was advising the, the Republic of Korea's army um, from just before the Korean War in 1949 all the way through 1954. Um, more recently, you had the Military Assistance Command Vietnam, MACV, from 62 to 73. Um, we had MIT teams in Iraq, uh, in the mid 2000s, um, and then we've done uh, or we've done in, in Afghanistan, for example. My personal experience was uh, we did uh, ministerial uh, level advising and general staff level advising um, to the Afghan armed forces uh, at a very high level, while the tactical level uh, advising was going on in each of the the RCs uh, w- within. Uh, the Afghan uh, effort. The uh, institutional advising, you know, that, that's the kind of stuff you do is you're trying to get these long-term enduring um, outcomes, right? It's the old, instead of, you know, giving somebody a fish every day, you teach them how to fish and then you don't have to do the same things. They can take, take control of their own destiny. Um, but that's not really our focus uh, here today. I just wanted to share that experience. Well, I appreciate that, sir, and that's a good look at it from a higher perspective, but let's dig down a, a little deeper to the actual SFAB. And so I want to turn to the origin story here, and I think we'll start um, 
with with General Hill, if you would, if you, you took command of 2nd SFAB in 2018, and although the mission wasn't new, as Colonel Creed described, the organization certainly was. So could you give us some background on the origin of the SFAB and what was the Army trying to get after with the SFAB, sir? Yeah, thanks, Chris. And, uh, and, and historically, the concept wasn't new, but, but the approach definitely was new. And so historically, you know, all, all those... Um, you know, previous examples had been ad hoc efforts. They were, hey, we've got a requirement. Hey, let's throw some individuals at that problem or let's throw a unit and retask it. So, uh, you know, we, we've talked about SFATs, Security Force uh, Assistance Teams, or uh, there were some Security Force Assistance Brigades that were designated, I think that term started being officially designated around 2011, 2012. Uh, where we were taking brigade combat teams and then tagging them to be uh, a security force assistance brigade. So you ripped out all of the leaders, the NCOs and the officers out of that formation, left more than half the brigade at home station, gave this formation this advisor mission, and then sent them off to Iraq or Afghanistan. And so we've been doing this, but, but with General Milley's vision, it was, hey, let's quit breaking these brigades. Let's build this purpose design force, this brigade, that's sole mission is to go in and do this advisory uh, assist mission. And so it, it, it was a similar idea, but a new approach to that. Uh, one of the things that helped me in building second SFAB was I got to watch first SFAB uh, get built at Fort Benning. Uh, Brigadier General Scott Jackson formed and stood up and deployed first SFAB. I got to see that uh, as the, the 18th Airborne Corps G3. Uh, they were a force comm unit, and so we, we assisted in their formation and their training path. I got to watch all of that. Got to go to their CTC rotation, uh, JRTC, when they were you know prepped and validated to deploy. I spent a couple weeks at Fort Benning, uh, getting to know their leaders and talking about all the lessons learned that they, that they had gone through and building this formation from the ground up. And then they walked me through, and I got to participate in their selection process because, again, these, these are not, this is not an ad hoc organization. This is a purpose-built organization. And one of the things very early on that we said we were going to do was, hey, we're going to handpick the right folks. And, again, that was General Milley's vision of these are experienced captains, majors, NCOs at each echelon who are, you know, KD complete uh, in their positions. Uh, before they go in and advise, because doctrinally we wanted to be able to advise two levels up to our partners. So you, you really need quality people who are experienced in that. And so that was the new framework of this this old idea. And you know, it, it was hard doing it the second time. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't imagine you know watching uh, General Jackson and his team do it the first time. But uh, you know, I was the first guy in the brigade. On day one at Fort Bragg, uh, we, we joked that the uh, the first brigade formation was in my office. There were eight of us. We sat at a desk and or sat around a table and, and talked about how we were going to do this. And, and we, you know, said, hey, this is these are lessons learned from first SFAB, and these are the things that we want to do. Uh, and one of the things that really backstopped what we were doing was we had an anticipated deployment date. Mm -hmm. And so we, we, we knew what we thought right looked like with first SFAB. Mm -hmm. We knew when we were going. And we knew when we had to, you know, what we had to do to get there, and we put that together, and then refined it as we went because we were having a constant dialogue with First SFAB to inform uh, our build. Now, you know, the Army builds formations all the time, but it takes years. I think, you know, if you, if you take the force management class at Le here at Leavenworth, I think it, ideally it's a seven-year process. Uh, that's what my 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 force my guy told me in the brigade. You know, we did it, you know, first, first Brigade did it in less than 12 months. We did it in a little over 14 months, and each Brigade got a little bit more time, but it, all of us were well, we're still inside that seven-year template of, of building the formation from the ground up. So that, that's just a taste of, of what it was like uh, from the beginning. If you don't mind, I'm going to jump in on Yes, sir, absolutely. Uh, so as General Hill described, we were designed uh, to be capable of advising two levels up, mm -hmm. and that is based upon how we hire and, and our positions and the rank structure. So a team leader has already commanded a company. A battalion S3 has already been a successful battalion or brigade S3. He's KD qualified. Battalion commander is a second time battalion commander and 
it goes up throughout our, our structure with all of our staff officers and everything else. So that gives us the ability to advise echelons above where we are. Um, I'll tell you, we're best suited for uh, the advise, uh, the training and advisory mission, mm -hmm. uh, other than some of the other pieces that uh, Colonel Creed mentioned. Capable of doing some of it and um, participating in some of it, I think we're an enhancing element to it, but not designed to do some of those other SFA tasks as it gets into really the resourcing, the funding, uh, the build, the rebuild portions of, that goes into SFA. Uh, where, do we, where do we gain momentum? I will tell you when we advise that echelon, if you want to start at the two levels up, so in Afghanistan, there are no division level uh, tactical commands. It's a core down to one star brigades. In TAC East, that's where we were established uh, and that's how we advised. Our strength comes from when we're advising at echelon through that one formation. Because what we establish is what we call the advisor network. Mm -hmm. So you've got advisors down as low as the company level, all the way up to the core level. So we are able to answer questions, provide resources, uh, which is the enabling portion of what we do. And in the event that we are allowed to or um, told to, depending upon ROE, accompany and enable on operations. On the echelon piece, that that wasn't by design, uh -huh. you know. I mean, that that evolved, and that I think really shows uh, what we were talking about earlier: uh, the the interconnectedness of the SFABs and how we learned from each other and grew. So, as the XORD was written, uh, it specifically was, you know, this is the Army XORD. Hey, build CANDAC level advisor teams, and I think it was thirty six. Mm -hmm which you know, fit the, the, the force structure of the SFABs. And, and just so we're clear, Kandak being an Afghan Kandak, company. Af no, Afghan Battalion. Afghan Battalion, So okay. then it's now it's two levels up. So you get this captain advising this battalion, battalion. commander. Uh, conventional force, this mm -hmm. is, and, and that's something we ought to talk about later on, is you know, conventional forces. This yes, is, sir. There's no special forces in SFABs. It's, it's a conventional organization. But that was the design. Hey, we, we had lost the bubble as we pulled back from Afghanistan. They were failing at the tactical level, and we wanted to build these conventional advisor teams to go in at the, at, with the conventional Afghan forces, the Kandaks, to help advise them. Because mm -hmm. the soft guys were doing great things, the soft Kandaks and the mm -hmm. Tejas and all that stuff. So that's what the XOR designed. And that's what, you know, first SVAB deployed with that mindset, and they did that not completely, I don't think, and you know, we have to talk to General Jackson to confirm, but I don't think all of his guys were down at the Kandak level because what we learned was, one, it, that, that really doesn't work everywhere. Mm -hmm. it, it depends on which TAC you're in, which region you're in, which core, and where, what, what uh, General Miller started talking about was point of need. We need advisors where we need advisors. Don't get dogmatic and say, well, the doctrine says you've got to go to the Kandak level. Mm -hmm. And so what evolved from what first SVAB discovered, and you know, my conversation with General Jackson, his brigade, with, with my brigade, okay, hey, look, we, we think we're good here with these Kandaks, but we really learned that the brigade is where you can really drive tactical operations because the, the Afghan brigade commander you know, he's got the WASTA, he's got the authority, he's got the resources to be able to conduct operations. Mm -hmm. And so we, need, we really needed to enable those brigade commanders. And then through our deployment, we, we started learning that because for, for the first time in our deployment, we had people at LOGCOM, which is, you know, the Afghan version of AMC. Mm -hmm. And so now we're discovering what, what General Mass talked about, the, the, the Afghan or the advisor network and that started having huge payoffs. Uh, but that, that wasn't how first SVAB deployed. We kind of explored it, figured it out. And then, you know, if you want to talk about, you know, going all the way up to the, the next, the third really took it to the next level, uh, literally uh, echelon wise. So I'll, I'll start with, uh, as you talked about the, the log com. And I'll tell you, when uh, I closed down TAC East and turned that over to a uh, lieutenant colonel uh, level, and I moved up to work underneath C Stick, I, I got the. Uh, the task of synchronizing their their national logistics convoys. I'll tell you, that's where the advisor network really paid off. Because now I had a battalion commander who was with the LOGCOM commander, uh, who was traveling through the entire battle space or the entire country of Afghanistan. I was synchronizing the movements 
uh, as they went through battle space to battle space. And I was using the battalion commander or the one star that was in that area of operations to inform me about what his core or CANDACs were doing to set the right conditions. Then I would request resources and assets to be over the top of the convoy to ensure it would get through. Uh, when Don got there, I think the average was 270 something days. You got it to just about 200. Uh, by the time we left through setting up this network of advisors throughout the entire country, we had it, our, our fastest time was 37 days and our slowest time was I think 97 days. So we'd gotten it under 100 days on average by being able to put people at the right locations, as General Hill said, that was providing the right information so that we could synchronize uh, assets and enablers throughout the country. Now, what General Hill was just talking about is we, what we found out was echelon can mean a, different, a lot of different things, and we're, we're talking about the tactical, operational, strategic level. By the time we left, because of the drawdown, um, I was actually advising at the ministerial level with the deputy MINDEF, who, who by chance had been one of the provincial governors in TAC East when I was there, so I had a built relationship. He trusted me, so Miller, General Miller told me, he's yours. Um, Again, Minister of Defense, know nothing about it, but I understand how the Army kind of runs. Uh, he was a civilian, so he knew nothing, so I was able to provide a level of experience to him and help him. And truly, advising is not telling a guy what to do. He's coming to you with, with problems or problems that you identify, and you're giving him a course of actions to work through. Because I don't understand how the Afghan government works. There's a lot of intricacies of, of, of that in itself. I, I provided COAS to him and gave him a sounding board of what I thought about what he was about to do. You're kind of like the honest broker in the middle of all these things at multiple echelons. So, but what we're talking about is relationships. And, you know, and we learned that over the years by doing, again, all of those ad hoc missions where we really, you know, at the end of the deployment, you'd be like, yeah, it's really about relationships. And, you know, it, it took me nine months to get that guy to trust me. But by then, we were cooking with gas. And then, but then we swap out. Well, that's what the SVABs, we started with that. Look, we got to build relationships from the beginning and we've got to build continuity in the relationships. And then there was handoff of those relationships. And they did, it was not lost on them when he's wearing the same patch. They, they got it. We weren't, you know, they knew that we'd been talking to each other and we were trained the same way, thought the same way. So that, to, you know, even they said, you know, yeah, that, that helps. They get it. They understand it. it so I'm going to add two points to that. I'm going to amplify what uh, General Hill just said. Uh, I've served in both these organizations, so there's no derogatory comments towards them. The 101st transitioning with the 82nd. Once that transition is done, there's probably not a lot of reach back from a guy back to a different division asking for help. Because we, came, we come from theoretically the same division, I had no problem reaching back to General Hill and going, I don't understand what this guy's motives are. I've got his needs, wants, and desires, but there's something off about him. What did you figure out? And then he would point me in the right direction for their databases to figure out all of his KLE notes and what, what he kind of came to the end state for. The second part about that is when we transition with 4th SVAB, even though the same organization like we talked about, there's always going to be a loss of a little bit of trust because you've built that trust over time and shared hardships. What we found out was when 4th would call us back in the States and say, I can't get this guy to respond to me. I'm hitting him on, on WhatsApp. I'm hitting him on Signal, which was the major forms of communication over there with them. He's just not responding. My, my team leader would reach back out to that guy and ask him, why aren't you communicating with him? I told you I know him. You can trust him. If you want the same kind of support, you need to answer his, his request for information or his, his calls. And we would reestablish those relationships from even back in the States which I'm not sure would happen between different divisions in our army. Well, and to, to kind of dive a little deeper on this, because I want to break it down to the average, let's say, captain that's on an SFAB. Who are they advising typically? Well, who's their counterpart? Um, and I'm curious about this because, you know, I have a background with the police transition teams in Iraq, and I struggled um, as a lieutenant trying to advise uh, Iraqi police station commanders, multiple commanders, I was out of my league. I couldn't help them. Um, I could do handcuffing techniques, but I couldn't get after how to get gas to their, to their vehicles or how to, how to do community policing. So I'm, I'm curious if, if the SFAB has addressed some of those issues that we had um, in our past by partnering better and, and, and getting after this. So what, what level do they partner at and how does that well, work? Well, the typical team 
-hmm. would be partnered with a Kandak, a battalion. So like you said, he's advising well above his, his uh, weight class. But I will tell you, they recognize the education that our officers come with. They, they understand the training and the experience that our guys come with. All that being aside, you become value added when you provide something to what they're doing. Whether that is over the shoulder enabling with assets, uh, whether that is just intel that, and they, they got to a point where they trusted us. This target, tonight, before zero two in the morning, and you're gonna be okay, I will support the operation. The first time they do that, and the right guy is at the right location at the right time, you've built trust, they know that you're providing something to them. It doesn't matter if you're a lieutenant or a sergeant first class. Once you've provided them what they need and what they require to be successful, and in all honesty, they wanna keep their soldiers alive too. You, you are an enabling function to that, you become value added to that team, and you can advise at any in, in the, you know, we had captains advising brigade commanders, which in their army are, are one-star general, brigadier generals. Um, I, I had an MP, uh, he was a HEC company commander, he was an MP, I needed an advisor for the provincial chief of police. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, Jeff, you're my man. <laughs> you know, sure. we, yeah. we, built, we built a team of advisors around him to advise that provincial chief of police. Mm -hmm. um, now, you know, he was the day-to-day -day guy, but I think what, what we learned was, you know, the advisors enable their partners, but then what, what our responsibility, and this is the battalion commanders and the brigade commanders, our responsibility is to enable our advisors. And so, you know, we're backstopping them with those resources. We're, we're coming over the top because, you know, they're, they're hierarchical society, like, you know, mm -hmm. even more so than, than the average one. And so when, when the captain can take you to the brigade commander, the brigade commander says, yep, we're gonna support that. I mean, you build WASTA with that captain and then that, that their partner knows, okay, got it. You, you, they trust them on all that stuff. It, you, know, you know, trust me, but show me. They're, you know, but you, all the Afghans are from Missouri. They're from the show me state, <laughs> right? Um, and, 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 and so you gotta have that conversation, which is back to the advisor network. I don't think we can emphasize that enough. The, the flatness of, of the SFABs, uh, you know, is, is a lot different than a BCT. Because if you look at it from an echelon point of view, those captains, you know, that's three levels down from the brigade commander. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's in a BCT, that's a platoon leader. And the average BCT commander is not, you know, interacting with a lot of platoon leaders mm -hmm. on, an, on any given day. Whereas in an SVAB, you know, you know who all the, the team leaders are, you know where they're at, you know what they're doing, you know who their partners are. Some you may be more engaged with with others than others because of who their partners are. So it, it's a very flat organization because it's, it's you're, you're advising at the point of need and you're putting that advisor capability against whatever that echelon is and, and you're attacking it. Chris, and I'll go back to your point where you said, well, I didn't know how to provide him tires or gas or anything else. Yes, well, neither did that team leader. Mm -hmm. But what the team leader had was a support battalion commander who was tied in at LogCom who we could track everything. We could tell him, no, he doesn't need gas. He just received X number of thousands of, of gallons. Mm -hmm. What he did with it, we don't know, right. but no, we know not. that he received <laughs> it and it's, it's somewhere out there for you. Or, hey, he hasn't received it because it's hung up at the, uh, at the pass. He can't get through the, the Torquem gate or something like that. Here's what we're gonna do. We, we'll put an emergency request for fuel to get pushed down to you. Uh, so he didn't have to know that. I, I can't overemphasize the network. Uh, that is truly what we brought to the theater because uh, what, one thing we haven't talked about, Don had the same thing. We had advisors in every one of the TACs. Not only were we advising the Afghan security forces, but I, we had advisors in TAC North with the, the Germans, TAC West with the Italians. And I'll tell you, a lot of their advising was advising the advisors, making sure that they were in line with the RS commander's campaign plan and his priorities. Uh, so there's, there was a litany of advising that was going on in theater simultaneously. Yeah, we called it, you know, multi-echelon. We talked about that. We called it multi-pillar. That's, you know, the police, the army, uh, the political folks. You know, we were partnered with provincial governors and, and those kind of the district governors and those kind of things. But then it was also multinational. And, you know, enabling our partners because the other advisors from NATO they've got caveats that, that we're not restricted by. And so, like, like Maz is talking about, they, they may own a TAC, 
but they couldn't do things. And so there was a TAC that when we got there, the TAC was run by a NATO partner who had certain caveats, but there was this targeting cell that was in physically in another building, not in that headquarters, because that nation could not target based on their caveat. That nation could not go into that targeting facility. Right. It was a violation of law for them. Right. But the advisors, American advisors, mm -hmm. could help bridge that gap. And that was something that, again, you know, it, that wasn't what the average, you know, BCT that had been, you know, uh, transformed into an SFAT mission. You know, we were the, we were the, the noun. We were an SFAT. We were the unit. The previous guys were the mission. Go do the SFAT mission. Now we've got this continuity. So when, when Maz's teams come in, we go, hey, you got to build this capability to not only advise the Afghans, but you got to advise these NATO partners, coalition, multinational advising to enable our soft guys, you know, U.S. soft, who were, you know, banging away, killing bad guys, but because of all these caveats, there, there was a loss of that synchronization. We, we could try to help bridge that gap. I think that was one of the biggest realizations, because we would pay very close attention, having been involved in the doctrine side of it, uh, some of the organiza organizational design stuff way back in 2017. And so the first lesson learned forum that, that addressed SFAB, and I think it was General Jackson who was uh, online from Afghanistan talking about it, I mean, it kind of blew our minds, because the way people viewed it here in CONUS was, the SFAB is going to replace a BCT in attack, right? Not that the SFAB is going to be covering down on the whole country. I mean, simultaneously at different echelons with allies and partners or even U.S. units. Um, and, and so that to us was was really uh, eye-opening, I guess. To us as well. Again, <laughs> ha having those, you know, late night uh, SFO calls, you know, Jackson's in Afghanistan. I'm at Bragg going, okay, what are you doing? He's like, well, they're talking about us doing this. I'm like, oh, wow, <laughs> that's not in the XOR. <laughs> that's not on my training plan. Uh, and then we were, you know, you know, rolling our own. Now we we focused. You know, don't anybody get uh, too scared. We, you know, we focused on building advisors to advise at the tactical level. You know, defend themselves. You know, provide all these tactical level enablers. I brought in, uh, you know, uh, Pat Work, who had commanded uh, 282 in Iraq. And you know his brigade fought with the Iraqis in Mosul, and they, you know, I, I got I was the the core G3, I was deputy J3 in OIR, so I got to watch them and go, wow, okay, that's this is even before I knew it was going to be in an S fab. I was like, wow, that's that's really effective how they did that. Now that was the TA3, you know, train advise assist, a company enable uh, concept that General Townsend, as the OIR commander, had really evolved which was, again, this very tactical push the Americans down where they need to be to enable the partner to get the partner to do what you, you needed them to do. But that, you know, when they, it, it worked great in Mosul and in Iraq, and, and, you know, Pat Work's team did phenomenal with it. But General Townsend set those conditions, and in that period of time, that was what they were enabled to do because of the threat from ISIS. Those conditions didn't exist in Afghanistan, you know, two years later. And so we had to modify where we had trained for that type of scenario. We thought that was what we were going to do. We evolved into what we've just been describing, which was much more enterprise level comprehensive, uh, sure. but has huge payoff because that's what, you know, that's again, back to your historical examples. Now we're building an army. Now we're building an army enterprise. We're not just building you know, a soft capability. We're not just building a battalion. We're building an army that can fight and sustain itself and conduct combined arms operations. I will tell you that, you know, we're informed by education and experience. <clears throat> Don and I were both in Iraq <clears throat> at the same time. Uh, he was an echelon above me. I was division chief of staff. Uh, Pat Work was down there. We were both watching what was going on over there before ever even knowing that we were going to be selected to command. We were informed by what we saw and when we came into our position as SFAB commanders, we trained, worst case scenario, high end, uh, and I will tell you, spot on. Because we, we could run the full threat spectrum, the threat continuum in Afghanistan. If it went very, very bad, that is what we trained for, uh, and we could do it. We could defend ourselves, and we could fight with our counterparts, or we could do exactly what we ended up doing, 
which was advising and assisting instead of the more of the accompanying the enable portion of it. But your credibility, I think, with any other nation's armed forces comes from their understanding that you can you can bring the hurt if you need to. I will tell you, this was the conversation my Corps commander and I would have every night. If I put a 12-man team out there, the power of America is over their shoulders. Right. That's right. And they and they wanted it. I mean, he that Corps commander, we he, he, you know, but they they he was like, hey, when are your advisors coming out? I want to go with your advisors, and I want to. He wanted them to be out at his hot spots because he knew that they would, um, you know, strengthen and enable his forces for, for all the right reasons. So then it became, how do we create that condition for the Afghans without physically being there? Right. And, and so then at night, every night in our, uh, our cubs, we, you know, we, we would have this drill where we, you know, we called it the, where, where, will, where will the Taliban attack tonight? And so the two would be like, all right, these are our indicators and warnings. This is where we think they're going to be. And then we would, you know, anticipate posture. Those advisor teams would be calling forward. I mean, it's advising. You're talking about WhatsApp. It was, you know, we, we had a, a district center early on in our deployment that almost fell. And, you know, our advisors were on the phone, you know, hearing the shooting in the background, you know, telling them, hey, it's cool. It's good. We're, we're bringing Apaches. It's, it's all good. We're helping out. And, uh, and it, it did. I mean, it, you know, all of a sudden, ISRs overhead and Apaches overhead, and they held, and that mattered. And so that became our, our, our effort to, okay, how do we set those conditions each night uh, to anticipate where they're going to attack so that we can strengthen the Afghans without having to physically be there? That's, that's next level. As so I, I took, because we spent 21 days in transition, I think something like that. Uh, we did a thorough right seat, left seat. There was no animosity between the organizations. We fell in on everything that he was doing, and my, my point was we will not change anything until we find out that something's no longer working. So we did the exact same meeting. Yeah, you know, that just comes across as uh, so radically different than the, our, my experience in 1415 uh, with the Minister uh, of Defense and the Chief of the General Staff where there was – a lot of resistance from the U.S. side because we, we transitioned away from combat operations and we were going to advise, and advising was the main effort, but Afghan partners really weren't ready to be left uh, alone uh, to do stuff. And so they were continuously asking for help. And all of that comes up, you know, to the highest level pretty rapidly, as, as you all have related. And, and then you find yourself in the position where you want to say yes and and it gets dumped on, you know, now these would, would or in your case, would have been General Miller, but back then it was General Campbell, of he's got to make a decision whether he's going to help, and if he, if, if he commits U.S. resources to it, to helping, then he might get in trouble uh, if something goes wrong. And that seems like that's radically, that was a radically different environment than, than you were in, in terms of how actively you were engaged out there. Right, and so one of our goals was in TAC East, hey, we're not the main effort. So let's not let's not sap the the, the OIR or, or not OIR the uh, RS commanders limited resources by becoming the main effort because something went bad, and so then it was how do we get the Afghans to use their resources better? So you know now this here here's the inter, the, the 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 advisor network in in play. So now you've got advisors embedded at the brigade level and at the core level. And we're figuring out their indirect fire capability, the, D, the D30s. And, and that takes time. So you got to go inventory their ammunition. You got to go find out where the range rings are. You got to get their historical data. Where are they shooting? How, what, their, what their consumption rates are and all that kind of stuff. This took, this took a while to do because they don't trust you. You got to build the trust. You got to get access to all this, all this information. Well, what we found was... They had taken these D-30s, and they were using them. One, they were using them in the direct fire role, which limits your ability to shoot over the mountains, which is where the enemy's shooting from. Uh, but they also had just spread the peanut butter all over the AO. But we, were, we had advisors, team level, battery, captain, young captains and sergeants who were doing the math and figuring it out. And they came in, and they said, you know, they, first they come to the battalion commander, and they come to me, and they go, sir, Corps done this with all these artillery assets. We think we move these assets here, we're going to get them into the fight, and we want to 
train and certify them to actually shoot indirect and, and do all these types of things. So we did that. Now that took months. And w what we ended up with was, you know, artillery positioned, Afghan artillery positioned against the main threat, which at that time was ISIS, in support of Afghan operations, but also in support of, you know, U.S. soft operations. So now we're not asking for resources from the, uh, the, um, the Resolute Support Commander. He can use those resources elsewhere. We're getting the Afghans to fight the Afghan fight, which was, again, that didn't happen overnight, but that's the strength and power of, of you know, professional advisors who have that network. Because it's as simple as, hey, how come we aren't shooting elimination? Well, I'm not going to get any replacement rounds. Okay, you fill in the paperwork. We'll make sure that you get the replacements for the elimination rounds. And, and once they see that that works, all of a sudden they'll start shooting elimination over that checkpoint that we've got intel is getting ready to get overrun, and then the enemy won't overrun it because they won't attack it because they know you're looking for them. Um, that, you know, that, that's the power of the network. This was about the time period that we transitioned and we picked up this mission too. The first thing we did was lay range rings around every single D-30 that was in the core, and we could show where he had clusters of D-30s that were covering the same, the same battle space. Uh, that was the final thing for, for uh, the core commander to start repositioning. Uh, what we then found by going out and seeing some of these firing points is we did not have trained crews. So I took a fires team from my 4th Battalion, and I put them in the regional military training facility that was right there with inside of the camp that we lived on. And they basically rewrote the POI and oversaw the training of the D-30s for certification. And then they would push those teams back out. So on their, their training cycle, we were rotating gun teams through all the time, trying to get every one of his gun teams trained and certified to shoot. And I will tell you, one of the big reasons why they also didn't use them is they didn't trust where the rounds were going to go. Uh, point it in the right direction, get an elevation, and, and pull the lanyard. I will tell you, once we proved on ranges that they could hit targets, and we pushed them back out there, they started using them. Uh, it gets back again, I'm gonna beat the drum, the advisor network, as, as General Hill just said, submit the paperwork, we've got access to track this document through the entire system, and we've got people at every one of those touch points embedded in their, their system to show us where it's getting stopped or held up or it's not getting signed, and you, Afghans just like Rex, everyone wants to do a wet signature on something and document what they've done and everything. Speeding that up and being able to show that it's, it's actually going to go, use your system, your system works, you just don't understand your system, uh, was immensely beneficial. So, <clears throat> General Masaraki, you essentially, uh, you touched on a good point with regards to, you, you show evidence or examples of both, um, obviously advising, which is what we're talking about today, but also the training piece when, with regards to the artillery. Can you talk us through the difference between training and advising and then how the SFAB touches both of those tasks, I guess? Well, we did both of them. As I, I just uh, example with the regional training facility down there, training is instructing personnel to do the specific task of which they were brought into the service to do. Advising is providing your counterparts with expert opinions, advice, or counsel. And, and, and Rich, just like you said, it might just be a sounding board, allowing them to vent and then helping them understand why things are the way they are. Because unlike ourselves, which in RS, I'd never seen a flat organization. I thought I'd seen a flat organization until I got over there. Afghanistan is very flat. Uh, we could provide information to them about why things are happening. Uh, and I think that was the biggest thing we did at the core level was getting him to trust the system that was in place and utilize the system instead of workarounds. Because we couldn't fix workarounds. We can fix our systems with people in the right places. Uh, so I, I would tell you, training is the 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 person to person, the shoulder to shoulder, uh, with the aspects of training to their MOS or their specialty, then advising is more of the coaching uh, aspect of it and providing advice. Yes, sir. Now, I know we've been sp spending most of our time talking about Afghanistan, um, but I do want to transition a bit to talking about how an SFAB would be used outside of a joint operational area. Because um, we're you know, not going to be in Afghanistan forever, in, in the, but the SFABs are obviously a valuable organization. So. Could, I will start with General Hill, if you could elaborate on maybe how the SFAB would be used, say, partnering with a nation that is not in, in, in combat, um, like we partner with Thailand, for example. How would the SFAB work there, and what would the differences look like? Yeah, so what, what, what we really started focusing on uh, was the, 
the competition phase is what we're talking about now. Mm -hmm. And so again, we were designed specifically for, you know, tactical advising at the CANDEC level, obviously Afghanistan. Um, and just for the record, second SVAB went to Iraq also. We had, we had advisors in Iraq and third sent some folks there as well before we, we pulled the advisors out of there. Um, but now what we're doing is we're regionally aligned a lot sooner than, than uh, was thought possible in building these brigades. And so, you know, first has got Southcom, second's got AFRICOM, third's got CENTCOM, fourth's got UCOM, and fifth's got Indo-PACOM. And then sixth, the, the, the Guard Brigade, augments each of the others in their regional alignments. So now what you're doing is you're giving a combatant commander, again, a, a trained advisor force that can go in and partner with a nation as part of the Theater Security Cooperation Program to train, we can do what, what General Maz was just talking about, we can go in and train people on a task. It could be as simple as skill level one task on marksmanship, or it could be you know, better employment of indirect fires in support of combined arms maneuver, it could be supply chain logistics, it could be intel synchronization, it can be pick your war fighting function because that advisor team, uh, we haven't really talked about that, that advisor team is the most diverse small unit in the United States Army. And by diverse, I mean the MOSs that you've got, communicators, engineers, infantry, intel, medics, artillery. Uh, you know, you've, you've got this incredibly capable small team and you partnered them at Echelon, as we just described, they can go start advising you on whatever it is that you need. They can train you on whatever it is you need or they can just be there with you and, and learn about the environment as a you know, it is a, you know, a flexible deterrent option. Hey, we've got advisors in this country. And so the combatant commanders saw that and, and sank their teeth into that very quickly once they started seeing what was happening in Afghanistan and Iraq with advisors. And so, for instance, uh, when I left second, we were planning on uh, moving into the AFRICOM. First, it, it, uh, it, uh, it, you know, broken the ice in, in uh, AFRICOM, had gotten some teams out. Uh, but then they were going to hand it off to us, and then they were going to move down to Southcom. So now, where we used to do exercises, when we we you know you go get a BCT, and, and I did this as a BCT commander. Hey, go send a platoon to Mongolia and go do this exercise with the Mongolians, which was exciting for that platoon that got to go, and that was cool. They got to be in a yurt, and they got to be in Mongolia, and everybody wants to go to Mongolia, right? Um, but what you find with you know conventional you know force comp type units is they've got training objectives they've got to sustain that readiness and so when they go on these exercises they've got training objectives that they've got to have mm -hmm. and so that i need to do squad live fires i need to do platoon live fires i need to do this i need to do that i did you know we did an orient shield and you know okay what are we going to get out of this well, when you send advisors, it's not what am I going to get as an advisor and as a training objective. It's what can I do for you, partner nation? Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that first did as they, as they were developing these relationships with, with AFRICOM and in Africa was getting to know those countries, getting to know their militaries, assessing. That's one of the things we do is assess their ability to do things. And then we can, you know, they can say, hey, we want to be trained on marksmanship. But once we've got our foot in the door, what we can we go, absolutely, I'll train you on marksmanship. But then we can also go, well, you know, hey, maybe we need to talk about, you know, your, your training infrastructure to improve your marksmanship. Or maybe we could talk about your, let's talk about your operations process so that this marksmanship actually pays off and you go hit the targets that need to be hit or do what you need to do. So it gives a lot of different things to that you know, geographic combatant commander, but then it also creates opportunities for that partner nation to leverage what we bring to the table. It's not necessarily we're bringing in close air support because they're at peace, but it's how do we help professionalize their their military? I mean, the envy of the world is the, the United States Army non-commissioned officer. I mean, I've heard that from every foreign military I've ever trained with. I've trained with a lot of them. And so when we've got our sergeants, that team's got one officer on it and 11 NCOs. Mm -hmm. And when they go in there and they're interacting with those militaries, that in and of itself is helping uh, demonstrate what a professional non-commissioned officer is and helping to raise the bar within that, that partner security force that, that, we're, that we're working with. Yes, sir.
Absolutely. So General Hill talked about what they would actually do. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll go back to your original question about the differences. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, the differences are driven by one thing, and that's environment, with mm -hmm. kind of two subcategories. Uh, one is the strategic, strategic and the operational, which is really driven by authorities, ROE, uh, expectations and capabilities, and then training and equipment that the SFAB brings to wherever they're going. The second thing, and I'll go to the tactical level, and that'd be environmental, speaking of a permissive environment, a semi-permissive environment, or a non-permissive environment. Mm -hmm. And that, that gets down to the combatant commander's willingness to accept risk of employment of small teams. And then you get down into what General Hill just described of what they're actually doing over there. I will tell you the ideal location for an SFAB is that competition phase uh, in which it's a permissive to semi-permissive environment mm -hmm. where we're fighting for influence and access in which they can get out and they can do all of those things that General Hill just described. Mm -hmm. When it gets difficult for us is in a, a non-permissive environment in which risk level is very high, which requires a, additional enablers uh, one of them being security, because the SFAB internally was not designed for its own security. We can do it, they're trained to do it, but then it limits the number of advising teams you can put on the field because advisors are securing advisors. Yes, sir. Uh, I will tell you that one of the greatest things that happened to us was the inclusion of National Guard battalions being our, our security force. Mm -hmm. um, I was lucky enough to have the first of the 128th the Wisconsin National Guard. I will tell you the best National Guard unit I've, I've seen in the Army so far, and I saw a lot of them when I was an OC at JRTC. Um, about nine months out, they were identified as our security force. Uh, we immediately went to every one of their AT or their drill weekends mm -hmm. and participated in those with advisor teams, which gave us training because we put our advisors at distance over our organic communications, and it forced us to learn them because that's the only way I'd let, let the teams communicate back to home station with Fort Hood, so Wisconsin to Fort Hood. Um, we ran their drill weekend or, or their AT uh, two weeks. And then we were able to go to the Div West commander and get their mobilization site changed. They were supposed to go to Fort Bliss away from us. We wouldn't see them again until JRTC. They'd go back to Fort Bliss, and we wouldn't see them until we got on airplanes. Uh, we were able to get it changed, so they mobilized out of Fort Hood. And uh, uh, the Div West commander, General Peterson, uh, allowed us to take over their training progression with oversight from his cadre to make sure they met all the requirements as they went through, which is mandated. Um, but they quickly became our 7th Battalion. I will tell you to the extent that by the end of our rotation, they were more than capable of doing advising, yes, and not just being our security force as we moved and, and we were in our KLEs. Yeah. Now, sir, you, you touched on the security piece, but I'm kind of curious about the support, command and support relationships. How does that stack up from your experiences? Meaning the SFAB isn't typically a battle space owner. You don't have an AO, correct? Um, and so you kind of have to fall in on the units that are there in mean, a place like Afghanistan. Can you explain? I'll tell you, Af Afghanistan was a very unique situation because I think doctrinally we were kind of battle space owners as TACI's command. Mm -hmm. we, we owned TACI's and made the decisions and we answered directly to the RS commander. Uh, I will tell you though, just like every other deployment I've ever been on, we did not follow doctrinal command relationships. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of uh, hand cons and acknowledgments of what each person was doing. We had soft that lived and operated with inside of our battle space that was living in small cops and fobs well forward. I had no direct tasking authority over them. I had coordination, uh, uh, support, supported, supporting kind of relationships, which is very, very weakly defined um, of what those really are and what the expectations are. But again, it comes down to the people that we picked had the right personalities to be able to form relationships, not only with our Afghan partners, but our soft counterparts that were out there. And as soon as we proved ourselves uh, capable to them too, it became, became uh, ubiquitous to what we were doing there. We were very well tied together. I would tell you better tied together with our soft formations in that rotation than I've ever been tied to them in any other rotation I've been on. So you bring up a really good point. And you and I, I think, talked about this uh, last week, sir, but you know, going forward to this regionally aligned model and, and that we're essentially rotating SFAB battalions continuously into the various theaters, right? Uh, so with all that being said, uh, there's got to be some sort of command and control relationship within the theaters, and my guess is it'll probably vary a little bit from theater to theater as, as the needs of the COCOM commanders. Um, but given that we, as an army, have talked about how the, the conventional force and, and SOF, the special operation forces uh, on the U.S. side, have learned to work together. 
over the last 20, 25 years much uh, more closely. Um, there's a mutual inter interdependence that we talk about in doctrine, but we actually, you, you all have got to see this uh, up front and personal. Do you, do you think that uh, this, this ability to employ SVABs on a regional basis um, and, and you're essentially reinforcing what the special forces groups are doing in theater in, in, in many ways? Complimenting, I think, is the term that we use. Okay, complimenting. Yeah. But isn't that a way to like maintain this, this, this soft conventional relationship and make it enduring? Rich, I don't think there's any other way to do it. I'll tell you the best thing that ever happened to us, and I think we all celebrated when they determined they decided to go to regional alignment earlier than anticipated, was it put us geographically located, so it, it kind of helps us with our, our training path, uh, it keeps us aligned against that area so we can actually run a, let's be honest, a real language language program right. instead of thinking I'm going to train for this nine-month period on this language and then when I come back i got to dump that and go to something else. Mm -hmm. um, because advisors get uh, ASIs uh, and we're looking to bring people back in, we can go out there and search that ASI, understanding that he's got a basis for language, he's got a basis for culture, we can bring them back in. It also means we're habitually aligned along with a soft counterpart because of the way that they are. So we, we, we've started building this connective tissue the day that we went region line. It, it's, it's no coincidence that, you know, first is at Binning, which is close to Eglin where 7th is, which is where WinSec is. And, you know, as Army University, I own WinSec and John Suggs and, and Tom Huff, who, you know, John Suggs runs WinSec, Tom Huff, uh, first SVAB commander, they, they are thick as thieves and they are co you know, coordinating with each other and they're tight with seventh group and they're working to be able to facilitate that, you know, relationship building, theater understanding, complementary efforts. Second SVAB, I brag, third, S, third, third SF group, right? You know, I mean, so, you know, first is up there with, with or fifth's up there with first SF group. So we, I mean, we did, we did that by design when they were basing things. Uh, third ended up at Fort Hood. Um, I'm not sure how you guys screwed that up, <laughs> but uh, but but it, it's you know it make, it makes sense to do that in in you know a, a vignette again to reinforce what Matt said about how well it worked together. Um, you know we get there early in in 19, and I fly out to one of these ODA teams, which is you know on the edge of the empire, partnered with you know Afghan SF running their indige forest classic sf mission i mean it was awesome they're you know living off the land you know it, it wasn't quite apocalypse now but it was some, it was some good stuff right um and they're 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 having great effects but they're frustrated because the the core and the brigades were well behind them tens of clicks behind them with their artillery and with their candax and they were not responding and so I'm visiting this young ODA commander, and, and, and I'm like, what, what can I do for you? And he's like, sir, you know, get these guys to come up here, because if they come up here, I can push further uh, against, you know, this is ISIS at the time. And, and I said, absolutely, that's why I'm here. I work for you. And so got those team leaders, those advisor team leaders, and we did our thing. It took us time. It didn't happen overnight, but it took our time. And then, you know, but when we handed it off to Maz and his team, you know, you had Afghan D-30s in support of Afghan SF and USSF that were kicking the crap out of ISIS and pushing them out of that area uh, and doing good things. So that was just true complementary efforts. Uh, you know, they were doing what they're good at and which advisors cannot do, and we were doing what we're good at that they were not partial to do, and it really paid off. So the and synergistic... The commander came down, hey, what can I do for you? The synergistic effects of that. So they were using an indigenous force that they built to secure and conduct operations with. They had a lot of intel that was not getting shared with the Corps, which was driving the Corps not to do things in that area because nothing was going on in that area. But there was actually a lot of stuff going on. Once that relationship was built, we got the Corps to push people out there, push assets out there. Then the soft community started sharing more of what they were doing, which just started this cycle of operations down in the, the southern Nangahar area which was the first place that they defeated Daesh. Yeah. You know, and, that, and that, on that, so let, you're talking about soft conventional interoperability, and I, and I think the, the advisors, you know, like I said, that we, we really help complement soft off efforts. But let's talk about interoperability with coalition partners, 
because that, back to your question about geographic command commanders and how mm -hmm. we could be used. So several years ago, I think it was um, 14 or 15, you know, I go to Benning for a, a, a you know, Mission Command Center of Excellence sponsored Mission Command seminar. I think General Rainey was the, was the Mission Command uh, commander at the time. And it was all about interoperability and the challenges of interoperability. You know, we have challenges in communications within our own force going from theater to theater and all that kind of crap, not to mention our, our partners. Well, you want, you know, and we were trying to solve all these problems with technology, with hardware. Okay, I'm going to get this gonculator radio that's going to allow me to talk to my coalition NATO partner. Uh, and we actually, I, I did an exercise, uh, Orient Shield, and, and the Japanese had this device that allowed their radios to transmit on our radios. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was, a, it was a piece of kit. We'd never seen it, and it was great. You know what a really great piece of kit is for interoperability? An advisor team. We've got the comms platforms that, that, that Maz is talking about. They can talk to anything. And, and so if you're a U.S. division commander and you've got a coalition partner on your flank in large-scale combat operations, I, I'd want an advisor team over there with them that, could, that I could talk to to make sure that that coalition unit's doing what I need them to do or getting the support that they need to do what they need to do and that kind of stuff. That's better than any piece of hardware that we could give our part. So, I mean, you're a hyper-capable or uber-capable digital liaison detachment by design. Exactly. I will tell you, this came up in conversations about, as we talk about the competition phase and being out there far forward, we'll call it the tactical edge of a semi-permissive or permissive environment. Uh, if it were to go to crisis or conflict, you've already got that team that's already out there. And depending upon our foreign security force partners' capabilities, they might not be as, as network savvy as we are. Most of them are not. We can talk anywhere in the world at any point in time. Until that DLD gets down there to start plugging in, that, that is your DLD for something that's gone bad initially and to start the, uh, the, the operational uh, aspect of it. Well, and you're also sensors. I mean, indications Absolutely. and warnings of things going bad. Absolutely. I mean, the folks on the ground will be the first ones to hear from the partners who may not necessarily share through. General McCombo said his primary purpose in the competition phase is access, influence, and IW. Mm -hmm. And advisors give you all that. I mean, all of that stuff. So I think we've hit some serious themes today as far as the SFAB as a bridge, you know, for interoperability between conventional and, uh, and soft forces. You know, we've also hit a, a, a serious theme that I've seen with the networking and quality personnel. And so, gentlemen, I want to I wanna pick your brain just a little bit about the selection process and the training for soldiers that serve on SFABs. Can you give our, our listeners an idea of what the SFAB training regime is like? I'll start off with the process of finding the right guy, and then I'll turn it over to General Hill. So I will tell you, both of us were the first guys that arrived at our organizations which is one of uh, 820. Our sergeant's majors were probably the second one. I was sitting at Fort Hood in the three corps commander's uh, CAG's office. He'd given us that office to work out of. And we're looking at each other going, says, what do we do today? And he's like, well, I think we need to hire some people or it's just going to be you and I sitting here. Then we've got to find some buildings on the installation. Then we've got to start receiving equipment. Uh, first part is recruiting. You got to go out and tell the story that we're talking about right now, and you've got to uh, garner influence, uh, interest in the organization. Uh, that starts off with mass briefings, and you know the deal. You're rolling the dice. You might have 800 people in the theater with only 15 people that are interested. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so we, those are the 15 we're going to work. Uh, we kind of lay it out for them, tell them what the process is. Mm -hmm. uh, they turn in a, um, a 4187 and an SF-600, which is their volunteer statement and then their medical criteria to see if they meet it. They do an interview. I interviewed every officer that came into 3rd SFAB. My sergeant major interviewed every NCO, and then we both interviewed uh, first sergeants and above uh, to bring them in. Once they went through that process, if we hired them, then they went into the uh, assessment and selection pool, and they were given a date where they went through uh, four to five days of assessment and selection. At the time, it was at Fort Bragg. They go through that. They go through a board. Uh, General Hill and myself, the other commanders, had teams that sat on these boards and were part of the, uh, the selection criteria. They get selected from that. They either go directly to their unit or they go to what we call the MOTA, the, the Military Advisor Training Academy down at Fort Benning, Georgia, mm -hmm. and they go through that, which includes a psych eval. I, I hate to coin a soft phrase, but I'll use it. Uh, selection is an ongoing process. Uh, they have to make it through there. We received reports on how they did 
while they were down there. And then a final determination is they come back to us. We determine what team uh, or what echelon they're going to go to, depending upon how they've uh, scored on everything up to that point in time. And then the training aspect starts, uh, which I'll, I'll turn over to General Hill about how we, we turn out a multi-capable advisor. Yeah, and, and before that, I, I, I want to I want to make sure everybody understands. Th this was not a seamless, easy, well-received process from the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, all of you out there that are that are looking for the juicy parts, uh, you know, there was pushback across the force um, to do this. And first, SFAB, you know, went through it. Uh, there was there was rancor in the ranks. Uh, there were there were leaders at multiple echelons that pushed back against it. They didn't believe in it. This is a fly-by-night thing. This is just the myths and another name and, and blah, blah, blah. There were a bunch of naysayers and, and uh, Debbie Downers out there. Uh, you know, it was the, hey, you're taking all of the talent out of the BCTs and the divisions. Okay, well, that's, that's not a true statement. The people that we were taking were hiring, you know, these are KD complete captains. They're leaving the BCTs anyway. The, you know, the people that we were really impacting, not the BCTs, was recruiting and, and um, the drill sergeants because the people that met the criteria to be, you know, persons of trust and, uh, and um, what is it, persons of trust and... Uh, oh, and, yeah, but... Faith and trust. Faith, people yeah. that you can depend on. Recruiters. You know, that met the recruiter, high standard yeah. for the recruiters, right? Th those are the folks that, that we were pulling into, and same for drill sergeants as well. So... You know, the BCT says, hey, I'm losing these people. Yeah, but they were leaving anyway. So that was somewhat of a disingenuous uh, pushback. Um, and then what, what it was also a very short-sighted approach because it was, hey, I'm losing these people. Okay, got it. But one of the things that we were tasked uh, by our boss, General Landis, was, hey, we got to give back better than we got. And so kind of to segue into the training, uh, we built early on, you know, that first brigade formation around my uh, conference table, uh, we built a, a training path, a pipeline, uh, and we, we first we call it the, the 30, 60, 90 program, and then we very, very quickly realized it was longer than 90 days, it was up to 180 days, and then, you know, depending on the MOS, it might go well beyond that, and it was not just you know, the things like basic rifle marksmanship, a nine-day POI to make sure everyone, remember I told you how diverse that, that team is? Well, you know, not, not every one of those different MOSs are as good with a rifle as, as maybe an infantryman is, but we made them all that good because we had a very deliberate, very uh, doctrinally sound and grounded uh, marksmanship program for the rifle, for the pistol, uh, you know, leading procedures, MDMP, uh, we did a, uh, a team live fire, uh, mounted and dismounted. Again, training for the worst case scenario. You know, understanding that if they can fight and you know defend themselves and get out of a bad situation, they could do all the other things, incorporating indirect fires and close air support and all those types of things as best we could in the training. So we had a very deliberate training path to create advisors who are very capable war fighters regardless of their MOS and you know our brigade second brigade's motto is everyone fights because if there's only 12 of you you, you can't have somebody that says hey I don't do windows you know I'm sorry I can't I can't pull that trigger today I, you know it's not in my job description uh, there's 12 of you you've all got to be able to defend yourselves but then beyond that it's you know how do we get this 35 Intel analyst and make them a better 35 Intel analyst and get them to the, the, the echelons that we described earlier. And so one of the things that we had going for us at Fort Bragg was we're right there with Forcecom, and the Forcecom G2 had, you know, Digital Master Gunner program that they ran for the MI guys. They had a bunch of great things. 18th Airborne Corps helped us out with their foundry and all that stuff. So we were able to, to, to really take some folks that are, again, these are on an on a, on a advisor team. It's a Sergeant 35 or whatever the MOS is and really train them and get them that extra training. The medics get them more training, more good training, but also higher echelons of training. So long-term care, since we're gonna be in these austere environments. Again, this is where that soft interoperability, you know, the soft community was very supportive of offering up training. Uh, they all but gave us their foreign weapons training 
uh, pipe, you know, they, they run the four weapons training school there at Bragg and it was, boom, it was advisors. They were like, hey, we got some slots, boom, and we were sending more advisors. So, you know, we're not SF by any stretch of the imagination, but, but having access to those types of things to build advisors. So, you know, don't, you, you get a, a sergeant coming out of an advisor brigade and they go back to the BCT, that's going to be the best pick your MOS sergeant in that brigade bar none. And that's the feedback. Once we started getting people back in, um, the uh, several of like the force com command sergeant major would go around and go, "Hey, you got any of those advisors in your? Come back to your formation." And we go, "Absolutely, best first sergeant in my brigade, best platoon sergeant in my." Brigade. So I'm going to jump in right there. My my first brigade sergeant major uh, that I had left uh, in the middle of our rotation. He took over a, a division, number division, and uh, I stay in communications with him about keeping those guys coming. I asked him, "How are they?" How are they doing as they come back out to the regular army? And I quote, the two best NCOs I get are the guys that, that have to leave the regiment because they time out or something, and the guys I get from the SVAC. They're my best NCOs I get in. I specifically select where I'm going to put those guys throughout the, the division. And then the compliment on, on what uh, General Hill said, although uh, I'd never have admitted it when I was a brigade commander, but we really like the idea of everyone fights. Uh, and I'll tell you, the idea of turning out a better soldier. So I'll, I'll just give you a little story here. Uh, we're, we're teaching uh, Battle Drill 6 because you have to un understand the fundamentals of Battle Drill 6 to, to be able to fight your way back out of a building on a KLE that's gone bad. And I'm standing on the catwalk with my Sergeant Major, and it looks like we've got damn operators on the ground. They've got pelters, they've got pistols, they've got everything. They are sharp looking. The breach goes off and they enter the room and I'm just like, ah, oh, stop, stop, I'm uncomfortable, I'm uncomfortable. I go down and I'm talking to everybody and I ask this question. Hey, how many times have you done this? How many times have you done this? And I get to this one soldier and I ask him, how many times have you done something like this? He's like, sir, this is the first time I've ever been in the field with knots and a gun. This is incredible. <laughs> and I ask him, and that's why this is funny. I ask him, what MOS are you? And he says, sir, I'm a 35 Mike. This is the coolest stuff I've ever done before. I've never done anything like this before. We are turning out better soldiers for the Army. I'll tell you, we, we had this conversation a while ago. We need to have a charter, kind of like the Ranger Regiment of Abrams Charter, where we take them in, we train them, we turn out guys that can do things with their hands and their weapons better than anybody else, and they proliferate that throughout the military, because that's really what we're doing right now. Yeah, that doesn't, I don't think that gets enough press. I mean, well, it, it, so there was some bad press early on where there, there was some recruiting saying, yeah, we're just like, you know, Special Forces, pick your SF light. Yeah, right, exactly. And that did not help the cause. Because then we get some folks in and they're like, hey, I'm supposed to be kicking in doors and shoot people in the face. And it's like, no, you're not. Well, that's what the recruiter told me. I'm like, okay, well, that's, that's where you screw And that's when we started accompanying the recruiting teams every time they right. talked to large organizations. <laughs> and, and, and so there, there were, we spent a lot of time going, look, you, you got to know these things, but if you think that's what you're doing, no. You've got to, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't know if it was General Miller or somebody else said, you, you I think it might have been General Jackson saying, you got to be, or no, it was, it was Pat Work. He goes, you got to be the advisor your partner needs. You know, and if they need you to kick in the door, then okay, wait a minute. So the, <laughs> you got to go back to the drawing. So the, the saying that we, we took that and we be the advisor your partner needs instead of the partner you want to be. Right. right, there you go. Because right. yeah. every one of these guys, because of the videos and everything else, thought exactly that. They were going to be accompanying these guys on the target. They were going to be shooting. They were going to be breaching and everything else. That's not always what your partner needs out of you. And it, it took a while for us to get that out of the lexicon that that's what we do for a living. We're capable of doing it if it goes that way, but that's not our primary task. Well, gentlemen, is there anything we overlooked today that you think would be prescient for our, our audience? Yeah, I'll just add one thing. Um, you know, the question is always, you know, why, why would I want to go to the SVAB? No. What, what, what's the SVAB going to do for me? Um, and the best way I can give you this, and I'm going to give you four quotes that I was given because I ask this question all the time. What have you gotten out of serving here as guys were leaving? It was always one of those last questions that we asked. And, and I'll, I'll give you four direct quotes. Uh, by serving this organization, I have been forced to become a master of my MOS because mm -hmm. there's only one of me on the team. If I don't know it, then they don't have the capability. Uh, the second was, th this assignment has taught me what mission command really is and how to operate with inside of it. Um, I'm pushed every day to be better because of the quality of the people on my left and right. And then finally, I've received training in this organization that I'd only seen happen in the soft community. 
And that gets back to what we're turning out to the, to the rest of the Army. We are truly turning out a better soldier to go back out there and do what the Army requires of him. It, it, to build on that, you know, as we, you know, transition, I focus from coin counterterrorism to large-scale combat operations. You know, assignment in an SVAB, that's a broadening assignment, right? Uh, now, you, you talk to young company grade officers these days, and they think broadening assignments involves going to graduate school and hanging out at coffee shops and, you know, pre-COVID and all that kind of stuff. And, and I say that in jest, but there's, there's this concept that, hey, I do my troop time and then I go do something else until I become a major. Well, you know, I think the majors we need for large-scale combat operations are the majors that have spent a lot of time in formations mm -hmm. You know, in uncomfortable situations, working with partners, thinking tactically, but thinking an echelon and maybe two levels up, right? So if we've got captains that are operating two levels up, they're already operating at the field grade level. That's a hell of a broadening assignment. That's setting them up for success to be better field grades. So, we had captains answering directly to General Miller at certain times in certain locations. That's scary as a brigade commander, but I will tell you that um, they did extremely well. I'll tell you the greatest fear that we've seen, you know, is getting people there is no, two, two big fears. Number one, it's going to go the way of the mitts, the spits, and the pits. Um, but my counter to that is the mitts, spits, and pits never had brick and mortar facilities. Uh, they, they, they did not have the organizational structure. They didn't have regimental colors. Right. Uh, the second thing is, well, why would I want to come and do it again if I've already done it and I've been successful? Aren't I risking everything? because we all understand what your profile needs to look like to command today and go on. Uh, I told everybody, you let me figure that piece out. You earn it and you deserve it. I'll figure out how to make sure that we're not gonna kill anybody. And that was the HRC's greatest fear too when we said we were looking for really high quality because we needed them because of everything we've talked about today. Um, we got creative and we, the people that earned it got it. And we, didn't, we were not detrimental to anybody's career. That was kind of one of the things that we talked about from day one with General Landis and General Milley. Um, service in the SVAB cannot be detrimental to your career, whether it's for PME, it's for additional assignments. When you time out, you've got to go out and get KD'd at the next position. We're releasing people, whether or not they've done their two to three years, whatever really what they were locked into, we did not hold anybody back. And so that gets to the trust issue. And, and, and then I think the recognition of if you're given better back, um, it should be reflected, you know, on ORB. I mean, an SFAB assignment should be an indicator, I think, for people, say, in the, the new personnel process. You know, if I see that on somebody's resume, that's an indicator, you know, assuming that the rest of the, uh, the documentation supports it. But, I mean, you know, somebody that gets a, a center mass in an SFAB, is, that's probably the equivalent of a top block in anywhere else, given the, the people on your left and right, right? I mean, I think that's a fair way of looking at it. Well, this has been great because this is, we've done five of these before today, and I think this session, I've, I've learned more uh, talking to you gentlemen and hearing what you had to say than uh, any of the others, maybe all of them combined. It's really, very good. I appreciate you being here. Well, on that note, I think we'll close things up. Uh, thank you for joining me today, gentlemen. I'd also like to thank our listeners and note that the views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the official position of the United States Army U.S. Army Training and Doctrine Command for the Combined Arms Center. I'm Major Chris Parker, and this is Breaking Doctrine.